Hi everyone, I'm Cyril Filias, the Learning and Development Specialist at CEREC. And on behalf of all the team, I would like to welcome you to today's webinar. And today we are here to discuss the new research done by SRDC and founded by CEREC on the role of career education on students' education choices and post-secondary outcomes. And to do so, I'm happy to be with Robin Ford and Audrey Appia, who are members of the research project team and who will be sharing today the key learnings of their research. But before we get started, I just would like to take a few moments to introduce you to CEREC, for those of you who don't know us yet, and just share some housekeeping notes with you for today's webinar. So at CEREC, we are a charitable organization that focuses on education and research in career counseling and career development in Canada. We found projects that create new knowledge and develop innovative resources. We have uh, three main programs, the Canexus National Career Development Conference that we normally do in Ottawa each January, but uh, which will be fully virtual this year. So you can visit our Canexus website if you want to get more information or to register. And we also have the careerwise.ca website, which features the top news and view in the field with a French version called orientaction.ca and the Canadian Journal of Career Development, which is free to access. So you can learn more about all of the CEREC works and resources by visiting our website at CEREC.ca. Uh, also, and uh, because Sarik is uh, looking at new webinars and learning opportunity for you for 2021, uh, we will greatly appreciate you sharing your feedback on this webinar, but also on your future learning needs in the survey that we will share with you at the end of today's webinar. So thank you in advance for, for your comment and your answers. Now, just a couple of uh, housekeeping notes for today's webinar. So you can interact with Ruben and Audrey and ask your question or share your comments uh, on their presentation at any time by using the chat function that you see on your control panel section. And also, please note that we will send you the recording of today's webinar along with the presentation slide later today. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce you to our first presenter, Ruben Ford. Ruben is a researcher director in SRDC's Vancouver office with extensive experience in the design and analysis of innovation spanning education and employment transitions. Since 2003, he has worked with educators and thousands of students in four provinces on six large scale intervention, investigation sorry, of early intervention to increase access to post-secondary education. He holds a PhD in geography and he is a credential evaluator with 27 consecutive years in program evaluation. Our second presenter today is Audrey Apia. Audrey is an SRDC researcher in his Ottawa office. Her strong research, analytical and data management skills support multiple projects. She earned a Bachelor of Art in Economics from the University of Ghana a Master of Arts in Economics from Carleton University, and she's currently a PhD student at University of Ottawa, writing her dissertation in health economics. We were really thrilled at CEREC to partner with SRDC on this research project, and we are very excited to have these two experts with us today to talk more about the research project. So let's not wait any longer to have them start their presentation. So over to you, Robin. Thank you very much. I hope you're now seeing my slides. Welcome. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time to join us on this uh, gray November day. Gray out here in Vancouver, it may be snowy where you are. I hope everyone is staying safe and well. We are gonna be presenting some work today that is the uh, latest from projects that started 17 years ago in New Brunswick, Manitoba and British Columbia. Now, so many partners at some point along the way in these projects, it would take most of this webinar actually to list them. So just know that we're incredibly grateful to everybody who's played a part, large or small. Most recently, the particular analysis you've seen today has involved four people at SRDC, Dominique Leonard, uh, Taylor Way, Audrey Apaya, who's done the lion's share of what you'll hear today and is my co-presenter and myself. SRDC is a nonprofit research organization. We have a mission to help policymakers and practitioners identify policies and programs that improve the well-being, 
of all Canadians with a special concern for the effects on the disadvantaged and to raise the standards of evidence that are being used to assess those policies. Now, often we do this through actively evaluating new interventions in the field, such as those in service agencies, workplaces, and schools that you're going to hear about today. But we also do more exploratory analysis to help understand the way the world works, and so we can better design inf interventions in the future. So in this case, we're using data from previous projects to start to answer some important questions about the long-term impact that career education in high school can have. Hopefully, what we've already learned will trigger new innovation and policy and practice, but also lead to more research on the long-term outcomes of career education. We are planning to poll you towards the end today to learn what you think those outcomes should be, what we should be looking for that is going to be different due to career education a dec decade or more later for high school students. But uh, right now, we'd like to use our first poll to help gauge who is in our audience and thus who we're going to be hearing from. Uh, Syria, could you start that poll? I'll show you the, uh, the questions here, but I think they'll appear also. So the questions are, what perspective do you bring to youth career education? We have four categories, practitioner, counselor, career teacher, or youth worker, researcher slash academic, government policymaker, education administrator, or other, you know, such as youth. If we can get the results. So um, we are looking at, it looks like we have 83% um, who are practitioners and counselors, teachers. Um, we have 8% who work with the government or policy makers. And then we have others, for instance, youth. And lastly, we have 4% who are researchers or academic staff. So we know that we are predominantly dealing with people who are from um, practitioners and counselors, 83% of them. Excellent, thank you. So uh, I believe we have a lot to interest all of you, but we can't cover everything in the time that we have. Um, also, this is actually one of the more complicated studies that we have done. So in trying to provide some clear messages, we may gloss over some detail that you need. Luckily, CIRIC has supported us to produce two reports which have much more detail and that uh, you can download from the website and there'll be uh, links also sent after the webinar. The first is a review of the literature on youth career decision making, very focused on what we know about the how, of how they go about it. And the second report presents results from our analysis informed by what we learned from the literature using data from three experiments providing career education to high school students. SRDC was involved in these experiments 10 or so years ago, along with many partners but we have continued collecting data from the participants in their post-secondary careers. A lot has already been published on those studies, but this is a, a unique project to look at career decision-making uh, using uh, data that's not been used before. So after I've introduced those projects, um, Audrey will guide us through the new analysis and the results, and we'll come back to end with some key takeaways and your questions. Our motivation for doing this work is, I think, fairly obvious. How youth think about their careers affects their futures in terms of their future education, their employment or training, their social lives, their finances, their health and well-being outcomes. And although Canada fares fairly well on indicators of K-12 performance and has high post-secondary attainment, there's differential access for many youths. We hear regularly how young people enter the labor market ill-equipped for the work that they will do. They drop out of education without completing at rates of 10 to 20 percent higher for some groups and uh, many find themselves needing to redirect during education. Some end up overqualified in this category known as PINES, poorly integrated new entrants, and some need to upgrade their skills. Others uh, end up unemployed or not in employment education or training, uh, the old NEAT classification now known as uh, opportunity use. 
this kind of transition derailment can cost students time and money and arguably society and the economy loses out on um, the maximum pro productivity on due to skills shortages or worker shortages. So policymakers and practitioners are likely to want to develop measures to target youth decisions at different stages to help people sort themselves better into the labor market. But as we learn from our literature review, surprisingly little is known about what works to influence career pathways among Canadian youth or even whether career education works. In order to help youth in their career decision-making process, there's a need to understand some important questions. We've tried to tackle four of them, but we know there are more. When do youth make career decisions? Where do they make those decisions? And how and what influences them? And this is what has inspired uh, the original literature review for this project. The first of these questions is when? And we have made a lot of the work of Lent and Brown on ages and stages. And this schematic sums up um, their work from a few years ago. We're of course very careful not to associate too closely each phase of career development and the age at each phase because everyone is different. But theoretical studies have identified different stages in career development covering the whole life course. Since we are focusing on youth, our discussion will mainly focus on the first three phases mainly uh, that are most important to the, uh, the current project. Here, Lent and Brown set the career behaviors normally observed at ages, which is tied to brain development, but also the structural factors such as how the education system and parents package and support, package and supply their support and information. Um, and I suppose equally how they don't package that uh, support and information at different ages. At kindergarten and elementary school, in this very early period, careers are largely fantasies. The focus of learning should be on basic self-regulation and developing self-concept, identity, and social skills. Students can be developing work interests and values by ages 11 and 12 that would indicate a need to access accurate and impartial information to support balanced exploration from this point onwards. And then by ages 13 and 14, interest can be firming up into provisional vocational aspirations and students will be seeking information on actual career paths that they can follow, sorry, to pursue different options. Arguably, they should be getting a sense of what work involves and the many different forms it takes. An example of the kind of program that does that is uh, Career Trek in Winnipeg. And then in high school at ages 15 to 17 and developing a wide range of essential and specialized skills, students are at a critical and an awkward stage. They're simultaneously still working out their self-concept, who they are, while already implementing decisions that narrow their immediate post-secondary options, what they will become. The crystallization of spe specific vocational goals is typically aligned with ages 18 to 21. These are also the ages associated with major transitions such as school to school, school to work, school to training, and also employment and child rearing as uh, possible choices. From the early 20s, youth can be moving towards uh, establishment where they have found career paths that seem optimal and work to consolidate their position within it. Now thinking about these ages and stages is important if we are thinking about who is responsible for supporting young people in their career development who will be dealing with the youth at these different ages and uh, what stage will they be at. This also says something about the where youth will be when they're making decisions and also part of the how and the what influences them. So age is an important prerequisite for stage because of uh, critical brain development. The studies we reviewed in our literature found that rational strategies and processes didn't predominate in the early career decisions of youth. The classic economic rational choice theory therefore doesn't hold. If it did, we would be bombarding youth with high quality information about the labor market and youth would make the right decisions. But instead, there is a lot of evidence that youth make risky decisions, uh, emotionally charged or using their affective uh, system of, of rationalizing decisions. 
So uh, we talk here about the, the motivation for making decisions uh, coming from their experiential um, mode, which is dominated by shortcuts or heuristics. These are uh, shortcuts, mental shortcuts that allow people to make decisions and solve problems quickly and efficiently, but which are influenced more by emotions such as fear and pleasure um, and uh, peer uh, relations than they may be with uh, the more uh, deliberative mode of thinking uh, based on reasoning and purposeful analysis of information. This takes longer uh, to develop and takes more effort and often emerges uh, later in, uh, in teenage. So with this in mind, we recognize that a more nuanced theory, many others uh, uh, stem from this type of theory, uh, like the social cognitive career theory, uh, to inform our study. This builds on um, self-efficacy theory from Bandura from the 1970s, and Lenton Brown built on it to describe a theory of how the interaction of your social environment, your self-efficacy, your goals and your interests lead to career decision making. The theory basically says that self-efficacy, your belief in your own abilities to engage successfully in a given task or behavior are important in influencing your actual behavior and also in the impulse to change what you're doing. In other words, what we do, what we think we will get a reward from. But this changes over time. Initially, we have a very short-term horizon, but this can shift to expectations of longer-term outcomes, what we expect we will be good at. And while this informed our analysis of our own data, we can't replicate this theory perfectly in our data. It's important to have an underlying theoretical structure to make sense of what may be happening and what we observe. And so uh, that's why we uh, spent quite a bit of time in this project trying to work out the best theoretical structure for the analysis. But our report reviews many other theories in the literature and there's a, um, a long list of those and an explanation which uh, if those are interested, I, I'd urge them to have a, a read of, of our first report. We also include uh, in that review what has been observed in previous studies, collecting data from or with young people. For example, there is evidence um, from the Youth and Transition Survey that Canadian youth moving from ages 15 to 25 experience a substantial degree of changes in their career decision making. About um, nine, sorry, I've moved on too many slides here. About 90% of 15 year olds change their career expectations by the time they reach age 25. And their indecision about their career choice can remain among uh, 25 year olds. Also, um, it matters uh, how parents value post-secondary education. The early career decidedness of youth is related to how strongly parents value uh, post-secondary education. And more generally, there's greater consistency in career choice uh, with uh, a higher family socioeconomic status. But the extent to which youth career indecision and misdecision is determined by age rather than a lack of appropriate guidance and supports isn't clear. And we'd like to ask whether career education could bring down this 90% figure by improving clear, clear career clarity at younger ages. And this is one of the questions that we set out to tackle. Now, other research has more directly sought to learn from young people what they think they need to make better decisions. Youth have said that they need help understanding their interests and abilities, better self-knowledge. Youth say that they need help acquiring information about future options, such as the post-secondary education choices. And sometimes this is differentiated in the literature between hot information, that is information coming from informal sources like family and friends, and cold information, which comes from formal or official sources. And hot information is often seen as more honest and trustworthy or appealing to the effective mode of uh, decision making, whereas cold information is less often trusted, even though it may be more often used in the deliberative mode of decision making. So uh, young people are seeking information, but they're also uh, judging that information by the sources that it comes from, 
which uh, poses a challenge for those providing uh, career education. Young people also want to obtain uh, accurate financial information about how affordable their choices will be. They want to help with the planning process and they want support more generally in making their career plans. And nowadays, many online resources such as My Blueprint and Xello in theory provide much of this information. But the meeting of youth's needs for this information is not evenly distributed. Um, and likely more and better hot information is available to those from higher socioeconomic groups. So this points to factors that we must consider in the design of career education. How can policymakers and practitioners intervene to improve the environment or the ecosystem supporting all youths in their decision making? So moving on now to um, our definition of career education, um, particularly in high school, we try to embrace the collectivity of school-based activities and experiences designed to both prepare and engage individuals to develop their careers. As much as is stated in the reference framework for successful student transitions endorsed by the uh, Council of Ministers of Education back in 2017. So we do include perhaps unconventionally wide definitions of career education in our research using student data. Various outcomes have been associated with different career education interventions in the literature in the past. Career education has been found to increase motivation to continue learning after high school, to reduce rates of high school dropout in high school and post-secondary. Counseling has been found to help integrate labor market information into the career decision-making process, what is often a very abstract uh, set of data can be better used by young people if they get help with count from counseling. There, are, um, there is evidence that the uh, career education programs increase career maturity and career certainty and can help uh, equalize opportunities for disadvantaged youth. Um, importantly, what's happening in Canadian high schools is not necessarily the same as in other countries, yet much of the evidence that we're drawing on uh, comes from other countries, even in Canadian reviews of the literature. It also mostly comes from observational or pre-post studies. Virtually no Canadian study has followed up long-term or had a robust mechanism for avoiding confusing the effect of the intervention from other influences like the characteristics of participants involved or the other influences in their careers. So this is where the new analysis in this project comes in. This is the uh, results presentation report that we're going to be drawing on for um, the results for the remainder of the, the presentation. We're going to be using um, data from around 7,000 high school students who took part in two projects that began back in 2003 to test three career education interventions, broadly defined. In the interest of time, I cannot describe them in detail, uh, but they were uh, Explore Horizons, or EYH, which introduced enhanced career education workshops and activities for students in grades 10 through 12 and to their parents. And this included families from both lower uh, and higher income groups. All of this took place in high school classrooms. The learning account, which tested an early promise of a grant of $8,000 to pursue post-secondary education, made available only to youth from uh, lower income families. These were tried separately and also in combination for some youth. And then the third career uh, education intervention is a high school academic engagement program imported from the US called AVID, which delivered classroom instruction and support in how to better take advantage of high school to achieve a better future. It's aimed at middle achieving students it featured uh, professional development for the teacher of an AVID elective class and other educators that those students worked with, such as an AVID counsellor, all serving the aim to increase the post-secondary enrollment rate of the participants. As I said, I'm not going to go into the uh, content in detail. They were very carefully designed at the time. EYH is the most closely aligned with conventional notions of career education. It engaged youth through a variety of trained facilitators from near peers to guidance counselors over a maximum of uh, 20 workshops of two hours each. But it was a fairly modest dose. Participation actually averaged around 16 hours over the three years or just five hours a year. 
Second uh, intervention is the promise of a grant. This provided information to students in the form of repeated reminders from the end of grade nine onwards that if they enrolled in post-secondary education, broadly defined to include apprenticeships as well as university, community college and private vocational institutes, they would be guaranteed $8,000 in funding over two years, which went quite a bit further at the time, 2008-9, certainly covering the tuition for a community college. And AVID contained several different kinds of support for learning aimed at uh, changing students' career decisions by pushing them to strive for higher career goals and opportunities. Even if you don't accept our broad embrace of these three different approaches as career education, you can still be interested in how these interventions disrupted youth's career pathways. This schematic here shows how learning accounts and EYH could be complementary for students from lower income families, removing a financial barrier that uh, may help motivate their consideration of their post-secondary options. While at the same time, uh, that's the promise of a grant would do that, the career education will be providing them with uh, uh, an understanding of how to navigate uh, sufficient unbiased information and uh, to learn how to navigate towards their uh, career aspirations aligned with their passions, interests, their abilities, and the availability of, of work in those areas. So ideally, uh, these two could be offered together and we test both the combination and each one separately. Importantly, all the interventions were tested via a randomized control trial, a bit like a vaccine test. All three, the EYH, the LA, and the combination, plus the AVID class membership, were assigned to the participants following an informed consent process through uh, a lottery-like process. There was a treatment group that was offered the new interventions in their schools and a control group that received the business as usual educational support and eligibility for student aid as was available at the time. We had three main measurement points, the baseline in grades eight and nine with parents and students surveys at that time, another survey in grade 12, and then a 66 month student survey, which would typically be during the second or third post-secondary year. Originally, we used the survey data and administrative data from the K-12 and post-secondary and student aid systems, as well as tax records, to examine the impacts on post-secondary enrollment and labor market outcomes. Um, such as earnings, and those, those reports have already been released. But now we're using these data um, that were collected at the time to focus more closely on uh, career decisions, coding for the first time the career aspirations that those 7,000 students told us they had in grade eight or nine, and also coding their later expectations, their education program choices and occupations for matches. This is meticulous work that has kept Audrey very busy over the past year, and this work has enabled us to tackle these questions on this slide. How does career education affect career aspirations and behavior along the path to career realization? Can we match early career aspirations? We are matching their early career aspirations to their intended program of study at any post-secondary. They're matching their early career aspirations to their actual program of study and to their initial occupation. And then we're looking at the influences of these career education interventions on those matches. We're also going to be looking at the effects of parents, peers, teachers, and counselors on the relationship between uh, these career education interventions and the career pathways that young people followed and which subgroups were more likely to switch or better match their path due to the career education. I'm now going to hand over to Audrey to explain how we did it and what we found. Hi everyone, um, like Ruben said, I'll be talking about um, how we came up with these outcomes and how we can possibly answer these questions. Um, next slide, please. Um, so, um, there's one before it, please. Um, so just like Ruben just said, we did collect some information at baseline at um, when students got to grade 12, which was at 30 months for us, are they? And at 66 months, and then when people and um, the students entered into the labor market, we took information on their occupations. 
Um, so what we did was to look at their early career aspirations and use that with their early educational aspirations and code them in the national occupation classification, which is um, basically uh, a four-degree code by Statistics Canada for each occupation. The jobs are grouped based on the type of job duties in the work that a person does. And we can equivalently do the same for the observed occupation. Um, the program of study um, that people intended, students intended to have, and what we observed as um, the program of study um, can also be coded into the classification of instructional program. This is basically based on the field of study um, that the students were reported to have. Um, ideally, what we would want is a standard form of um, linking an occupation to the program that the students studied, but there is no standardized way of doing this. So um, what the research team did was, um, because we, we had a random assignment, we have a comparison group and we have a treatment group, we looked at the percentage distribution for no codes for each um, CIP code using our comparison group samples. And we identified the major no codes um, associated for each CIP code, which is the classification of instructional program. And then we coded our outcomes provided there was no obvious inconsistencies between the occupation and the post-secondary um, program content. Um, next slide, please. So um, basically, we ended up with um, six outcomes on the career pathways. They are listed in a chronological order here. Um, first, at grade 12, we consider whether students continue early career aspirations that they had um, when they were in grade 8 or 9. We also check um, if they are, there is any improvement in career clarity, which we define as um, improving career clarity. Um, at the post-secondary level, we check if students carry out the post-secondary plan that they had at um, grade 12, which we define as carrying out the post-secondary plan. And um, we also look at uh, if students are taking programs at the post-secondary level that matches their early career aspiration, um, which we um, label as carrying out the early career aspiration, which is number four. Um, and if students are um, taking programs um, or they have a job that matches the occupation that um, they initially wanted to have, which is their early career aspiration, we label it as, as a, a realization of the early career aspiration, which is five. And finally, we look at if students are matching their program of study at the post-secondary level to the career that they have right now, which is six. Next, please. Um, we hypothesize or we believe that um, a person's demographic characteristics as well as the household characteristics and the career uh, education interventions that Ruben less, um, described to you earlier, as well as influences from peers, um, counselors, parents, and teachers can affect these outcomes that we have derived on the career pathway um, directly. Um, we also believe that um, these career education interventions can also affect um, students' um, experiences and behaviors, um, like things like their exposure to work, their self-esteem or academic engagement, which can in turn affect um, the outcomes that we are interested in. Next, please. Um, just before I go into my results, I would like to note, give you a key note here. The main um, idea behind the project was to look at the effect of these career interventions, the in, their impacts, and under what conditions they affect um, their career pathways. So um, the study is not intended to define whether these outcomes are good or bad. Um, so that is a key note on the side. Um, we 
because this is the case because for instance we can think of um when we say continuing early career aspiration, this could be a bad thing, um, a good thing for a student if this early career aspiration matches their student, the student's ultimate interests and ambitions. However, it could be a bad thing if there is no alignment between the student's um, early career aspiration and the ultimate interest and ambitions that they have. And I think there is a similar um, intuition behind all of the indicators that we had derived as well. Um, it could be a good thing or it could be a, a bad thing depending on the situations. Next please. So I'm going to take you briefly on a tour for my results. I'll be using some form of tables to um, show you my results. Um, a quick recap of um, the interventions that we are looking at. We have three main, um, we have um, three main interventions interventions we have the early promise grant um, we have the enhanced career education and then we have the a combination of the two projects as well as um, the bc abit um, on the tables um, on the top of the tables i have um, the chronological path of outcomes that we derived and you can think of the first two as um, when we get to grade 12 when students are in grade 12 the second two is when students are at um, the post-secondary education level, and the last two is when they enter the labor market. Um, the arrows, the red downward um, pointing arrow, just shows a statistically significant negative effect, whilst the green upward pointing arrows is for um, a statistically significant positive effect. And um, I'll be discussing the main impact as well as the mediation effect where we define the mediating effect as um, if the um, intervention the career education intervention affects um, any something else like the students experiences and behavior which in turn affects um, the outcomes of interest on the career pathway um, I we put into brackets um, the relationship between the career intervention and the mediating effect, um, the sign or the statistically significant level. And wherever you don't see an arrow, it means that there was no statistically significant impact. So to dive into the early promise grant um, results, we see that um, at grade 12, um, the early promise grant leads to, um, it reduces the likelihood of students carrying out their, uh, continuing their early career aspiration. And when students get into the labor market, it kind of increases the likelihood that the students have um, a career um, that matches whatever program that they studied at the post-secondary education level. Um, when you go down into the mediating effects, we see that there are both direct effects and indirect effects. Um, one thing that I want to point out is um, there is um, contradicting effects from um, academic engagement, which reduces the likelihood of um, students carrying out their early career aspiration, whereas um, parents' value for post-secondary education increases the likelihood that they would carry out this early career aspiration. And it seems like um, these two effects cancel out and there is a predominant um, direct effect, which um, from the learning account um, program, which affects carrying out the early career aspiration. Now I'm going to talk about the um, enhanced um, career education or um, the workshop. We looked at it from um, lower income students, from lower income families and higher income families. The results here is, is for students from lower income families. And we find that just like the early promise grants, um, initially the um, workshops reduces the likelihood that students will continue the early career aspiration. Um, when students get to the post-secondary education level, um, the enhanced career education also reduces the likelihood that they'll carry out the early career aspiration that they had in mind. And um, finally, when they enter the labor market, um, the realization of their 
career is different from um, what they had in initially aspired to do. And we see that there isn't in um, there isn't so many mediation effects um, among the lower income families, families from low um, students from lower income families. Now I'm going to talk about the same workshop or enhanced career education for higher income um, student, students from higher income families. We see that immediately for the direct, um, for the impacts of the program, um, when students get to grade 12, there is no effect of the program on um, any of the outcomes. However, when they enter for secondary education level, um, the enhanced career education reduces um, the likelihood that students will carry out the Apple secondary plan as well as carrying out the um, their early career aspiration and when they enter the labor market their realized career is different from their um, career um, their aspired career however they um, the program the enhanced career education program increases the likelihood that a student will end up with a career that matches what they studied at the post-secondary level. Um, here, it is also interesting to um, look at the fact that there is both direct effects and indirect effects from things such as um, the grades, volunteering, and um, the number of career activities, as well as how parents value for secondary education level. Um, although we do not, one thing that I want to highlight on is although we do not see any direct impact on of the program on continuing early career aspiration, um, the enhanced career education increases average grades, which in turn leads to students continuing their early career aspiration. However, um, volunteering activities decreases the likelihood that um, students continue their early career aspiration, which tends to cancel out the two effects and we don't see any direct impact of the program. Yes, please. Um, when we look at the combination of the early promise grant and the enhanced education, um, the enhanced career education, this is very similar to the effects that we found for the early promise grant program alone, um, with just a few exceptions. Um, we see that the main exception is um, the residual effects, direct impacts of the program is minimal in this case. We end up with, um, when we look at the mediating effects, we only end up with a, um, a direct impact of the realization of the career plan through post-secondary education. Yes, please. Um, now to talk a bit about the BC AVID program. We only had information on students' um, career, their early career aspirations and the program that they studied at the post-secondary level. So um, just like um, the workshop programs for um, lower and higher students from lower and higher income programs, we see that um, most people who took part in the BC AVID program end up with a career, uh, end up with a program that is unmatched to their initial career aspiration. When we consider me, um, the mediating effects, there is um, some small indirect effects from the academic engagement when they get to grade 12, but the direct impact is very predominant. And we see that the unmatch um, relationship between the program that they end up studying and um, their career um, aspiration is um, different. Yes, please. Now, I want to talk about the role that counselors, parents, and um, post-secondary positive peers play. Um, before I dive into it, um, something that I want us to note is the fact that although we are providing the effects of each of these groups, um, we, we do not want, it is very difficult to draw conclusions about the impacts um, these people's, these groups impact on the pathways. This is because that we believe in the fact that 
students who may talk to counselors, for instance, may have different needs and knowledge from um, students who do not. And therefore, we cannot associate um, any differences that we have to just the role that the counselor played or the parent or their peers played. However, I'm going to discuss um, what we find. Um, we find that while talking to parents is associated with continuing the career aspiration, um, enhanced career education reduces this effect, um, which is in line with the overall effects that we found for enhanced career education. Um, we also see that um, if you have a, a, a friend who is uh, positive about post-secondary education, um, it does not necessarily lead to improved career clarity, but um, these peers kind of enhance the, um, the effect that career education has on improving career clarity. Um, almost universally, um, engagement with any of the counselors, your peers and parents was associated with a lower likelihood um, of carrying out the original um, post-secondary plan and having access to um, career education further amplify the effects which is shown um, at the bottom of the graph. And finally, engagement with counselors, parents and peers um, increase the chances of you carrying out your early career aspiration, which means that you ended up in a program that matches your early career aspiration. Um, however, when we interact um, these, the role of the counselors, parents and peers with um, our career education interventions, we do not see any effect. Next slide, please. Now I'm just going to talk briefly about um, people with different socioeconomic background, um, specifically students who had um, some parent, um, parents who have some um, post-secondary education level and those who did not, who had parents with um, no post-secondary education. And we find that um, among students whose parents um, had um, some form of education beyond um, high, the high school level, um, there is the likelihood that they will end up switching what they had initially intended to, um, to have as a career when they get to grade 12. And the effect is kind of um, does not exist when you look at um, students who have post-secondary educated parents. Um, career workshop also led to um, students um, carrying out early career aspiration um, for both groups, but the effect was larger among students who had lower educated parents. And when there is an early promise grant or the LA program led to um, a reduction in the likelihood that um, students will realize an early career aspiration. Um, and this is um, different for um, students with um, post-secondary um, post educated parents. Um, in general, what we found is that the FTD intervention had impacts on students who had um, less educated par parents in general. Next slide, please. So what I've been rambling about, um, I would like to summarize it in my key findings. So um, one thing that we want to point out is for students that are from higher income families, um, workshop um, had an effect on carrying out um, their post-secondary um, education plan, as well as carrying out and realizing their early career aspiration. Volunteering was a good um, indirect effect. And we also found that career education interventions um, kind of had increased um, academic engagements as well as um, career um, related activities. Um, this was, however, not um, the case for lower income for students from next slide. Next slide, please. That's your presentation, Yeah, so finally, to summarize all what I've said, um, we see that 
these career education interventions kind of realign um, the focus of students for who had peer, um, parents who had higher education, and it reinforces um, existing plans for those whose um, parents had some form of post-secondary education. And um, at the initial stage of, of the path, um, the career pathway, um, there is a decreased likelihood for students um, from lower income household to carry out the initial, what they had initially aspired to do. Um, but in, at the end of the pathway, we see that most students tend to end up with a career that, that matches what they studied at the post-secondary education level. And now I'll turn it over to Ruben to give you the key, give our um, takeaways that we've learned from the project. Thank you very much, Audrey. As you can see, the findings are fairly complicated and we have um, we've tried to work hard to simplify the messages coming from the, the project. I think the kind of high level finding is that um, from this rigorous longitudinal evidence, from experiments, perhaps nothing new, but um, it is the case that career education changes high schoolers' career decision pathways. And that it's really important to see uh, the difference between career aspirations um, as students uh, express them relatively early in high school as very distinct from uh, what outcomes may be optimal for them when they realize them later in life. So, um, Career education may mean that the initial career aspirations are less often realized as occupations. And the objective of career education may not be to get people to the occupation they have immediately in mind. The effect of career education interventions varies in the early career path for different groups of youth. And this is one of the key findings from this uh, project. Those with lower educated versus post-secondary parents and those with lower income versus higher income uh, have different experiences of career education. And one particularly important finding is that, that career education cannot provide reassurance with respect to the affordability of post-secondary education as came with the learning accounts and the youth career aspirations and motivations to explore alternatives may be, may be constrained. So in designing career education, we have to remember other factors are important besides uh, the career education intervention itself. Parents' values and career, peers' intentions do have an impact, and we may have to uh, be uh, aware of those and build uh, strategies in to um, uh, acknowledge those. Also, having contact with counselors, um, the grades that people have, whether they are able to participate in volunteering can make a difference. These factors mediate or influence the direct effects of the career education on the career pathway. However, the opportunity to access several of those influences is unevenly distributed. So as Audrey mentioned, we're not saying that these are necessarily positive or negative in terms of change. We know the changes are happening. What we'd like to do next if we secure funding is to track youth further to get closer to understanding the lifetime implications of the career inter education interventions. So what are the impacts of these interventions on the chances of being unemployed? Uh, do the career interventions we looked at impact how much youth go on to earn? And do they impact their physical and mental well-being? So um, to help us with that, we would very much appreciate um, your answers to the last poll question, which is about the outcome that you think high school career education should be ultimately aiming to optimize. We're limited to uh, four choices. Um, so we've got here match the match between aspirations and employment or education choices, the overall life satisfaction of, uh, of people and their well-being their financial security, or all of the above. Um, if you could launch the poll, that would be great. Thank you. Um, while that's going on, we had a question about um, the classification of instructional programs. So just want to clarify, we use the National Occupational Classification and the Classification of Instructional Programs. Both of these are systematic classifications used by Statistics Canada, one for uh, the different occupations in the labor market and the other for um, the instructional programs according to the field of study. And uh, Canada has adapted uh, classification of industrial 
of classification of instructional programs for its uh, um, for the programs available in Canadian institutions, and we were uh, matching the aspirations and the actual uh, programs taken by students to that standard classification. So the polling answers. Um, so we have um, seven percent that believe that um, it should be all of the above. Um, Seventeen percent thinks it should be overall life satisfaction and well-being, and thirteen percent thinks that it should be a match between aspirations and employment or education choices. So I think what we are getting from this is most of them think we, it is important to look at all these outcomes and how it affects the career pathway. So now we'd be really happy to open up to questions. Uh, just a quick plug um, that there will be a learning lab at Connexus in January to continue this discussion, how young people make career decisions, who to target with what and when. And the idea behind the uh, learning lab is to build an agenda for future action in research and practice, what works well, what needs to change. And we're looking forward to hearing from more of you then. Thank you, Ruben. Thank you, Audrey. Uh, and thank you all for your question. We received, yeah, we received a lot of great questions and comments, and I will make sure to share them with uh, our presenter uh, today. Maybe we can start with one, uh, one comment or question that um, Ruth was sharing with us and uh, ask you to uh, share your input on it. Uh, would you please speak to mandatory career development courses in all Canadian schools? At this time, these appear to be no consistencies by developing personal and career competencies, which make it difficult to ensure equity of opportunities for students. Many still believe that only certain students require career uh, development education, which erodes the possibility of a culture of career education for all youth. That's a good question, making a, a point. Um, I, I think um, from the evidence that we have, um, the uh, studies that we presented today, and also some more recent uh, career education interventions that we have um, made in uh, some schools uh, in, a, in a mandatory way that every student in uh, grade 12 was uh, expected to attend in, in three workshops, um, that there is a tremendous amount of um, change in students' behavior as a result of um, experiencing uh, mandated uh, career education. Um, and obviously the challenge is to say whether that is a good or a bad thing. It is clearly very influential and young people are uh, very readily influenced by these types of, of, of programming and assuming that the content, the curriculum is well thought through and that uh, individuals are getting a, a wide range of information, it would seem to make uh, sense that um, this should be a, a critical part of the curriculum for all students. So we have, um, we have evidence that these interventions change post-secondary decision making and that people go on to uh, higher uh, incomes later in life as a result of participating in them um, and so uh, it seems that on balance at least uh, in the absence of having done the full 10, 15, 20 years follow-up um, that, that uh, making these type of interventions available to people make career education mandatory would lead to um, positive outcomes for, for young people. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Robin. Uh, another question from uh, Maria. I work with students with special needs. What role did students with special education needs play? Are their results similar or different? Um, I think I'm going to go in for that. So I think um, the study that we have currently does not specifically address that. Um, we do have information on students who are disabled or not, but um, due to data issues, we were not able to do um, like subgroup analysis of whether these effects, um, like we did for um, 
higher or lower income household um, families. But this is something that we, we need to consider and it, I think it plays a role. But in general, we do believe that um, since um, career education interventions have a role to play on the pathway, um, we believe although they have special needs, these career interventions might um, lead to uh, um, might impact um, people who are disabled as well. They are career pathways as well. Thank you, Audrey. Um, we got a very, a very, very good comment and question, so I'm trying to uh, to address them. But maybe we'll take uh, the the last one for today. And again, I will make sure to share them with you. Uh, Nada, <clears throat> sorry, Nada is asking: Do you think the career planning process should start before high school, grade twelve? Um, we have completed a study fairly recently looking at uh, empowering young people uh, in making their career decisions um, and done a review of the programming across Canada that tries to uh, to do this at different ages and uh, there's certainly um, some evidence although it's not from these kind of studies uh, that um, making uh, career education part of elementary curricula is uh, beneficial to young people. While recognizing the ages and stages we talked about earlier, um, there's been um, a, a lot of, of work, uh, as I mentioned in, in the presentation in, in Winnipeg with the Career Trek program to find the optimal way to deliver that kind of, of support, not necessarily always in the classroom, but uh, encouraging uh, people from uh, a wide range of, of different families, certainly those from more disadvantaged backgrounds to take part in, in uh, career education at a younger age and to be exposed to the world of work, to learn about um, uh, the different types of careers that they could consider uh, long before they enter high school. Um, we'd love to do more work on those kinds of, of, of programs to, uh, to track the outcomes. And in the long run, I think uh, that that's where this work will be going. Um, what we're working with what we have at the moment, which considers early career education to start in grade eight and nine rather than uh, earlier than that. I think there's a lot of potential from, from those earlier interventions. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Robin. And, and unfortunately, yes, that was the last uh, question for for today. It was really terrific to see uh, this great engagement today with uh, with a lot of questions. So thank you all for your participation. And Ruben and Sarah, thank you for your presentation today. It was it was really great to get the opportunity to discuss the the key findings of the this research project and including the uh, the evidences showing what factors and intervention do influence the career aspiration of high school students. So thank you again for this great research project and for having shared your key learning with us today. Thank you to everybody for taking part. Um, we really appreciated the great questions. Thank you. And, and of course, I think one hour is not enough to cover all of the research project. So if you want to learn more about the funding, I will encourage you to download the final report of the project that is accessible for free on our webpage at sarek.cs slash career education in youth. Uh, you may also want to continue your learning journey on how we can best support our students with another webinar at CERIC that will start this Wednesday, November 25, and that is called The Role of School Counselors in Supporting Positive Outcomes for Black Students. So if you want to get more information or to register, you can visit our website at CEREC.cs slash webinars. And finally, another great learning opportunity that is happening soon at CEREC is our Connexus conference where uh, Ruben and Audrey will continue the conversation. And uh, you may also want to join the 1700 of your peers who have already registered to our virtual format this year. So if you want more information or to register, you can visit our Connexus website at connexus.cereck.ca for more information. But as for now, please don't forget to share your feedback and future learning need with us in the survey that will just pop up on your screen. And let me close by thanking you once again, Ruben and Audrey, for your presentation today. And thank you all for your great participation. So we hope to see you at another learning opportunity very soon. Have a good day.